Welcome to LSE IQ. This month we're rerunning an episode from 2021 which asks, what's it like to be an animal? Since this episode was recorded, the UK Animal Welfare Act 2022 has become law. This extends animal welfare protections to animals such as octopuses, lobsters and crabs, a direct result of the findings of LSE academic Dr Jonathan Birch featured in this episode, that animals are sentient. They have the capacity to experience pain, distress or harm. This is my cat, Otis. I spend much of my days staring at him, wondering exactly what he's thinking and feeling. Who are you, Otis? What do you want? (coughs) Welcome back to a new season of LSE IQ. This is the podcast where we ask social scientists and other experts to answer one intelligent question. I'm James Ritty from the IQ team. We work with academics to bring you their latest research and ideas. Inspired by Otis, in this episode I'll be asking, what is it like to be an animal? We'll travel to the local park to find out how smart dogs are. We'll hear about a campaign arguing that chimpanzees should be classed as people with their own rights. And finally, we'll ask whether insects and other invertebrates have feelings. Associate Professor Jonathan Birch leads the Foundations of Animal Sentience project, which is based at LSE. While research into animal sentience is relatively new, Jonathan told me that interest in animals' subjective experience has a long history. Even in ancient Greece, Aristotle had this notion of of a sensitive soul. Plants have merely nutritive souls, they merely grow, but animals have sensitive souls, they're sentient, they feel things. So what do we mean by sentience? I think sentience is feeling. It's from the Latin for to feel. It's the capacity to have feelings. And feelings are states that we're very familiar with from our own lives. They include joy, happiness, pain, pleasure, comfort, thirst, hunger, warmth. They can be anything from quite basic bodily sensations to quite complicated emotions. To be sentient is just to have feelings, for there to be something it feels like to be living your life from your point of view. Animal subjectivity is a topic that has also long fascinated Professor Kristin Andrews, the York Research Chair in Animal Rinds at York University, Toronto. Her interest in animals, like many of us, began at an early age. It's funny, it's one of those, I think, kind of typical children's stories that I loved animals when I was a kid. We adopted a stray cat. I watched Flipper on TV, you know that show with the dolphin? Yes. yes. (laughs) We call him Flipper, Flipper, faster than lightning. Um, And I just always thought that the animals were really interesting and that they had a lot to teach me. And so when I was doing my undergraduate studies at Antioch College, I had the opportunity to visit a dolphin cognition research lab, and I just completely fell for the research as well. And do you think, um, as as a species, we have a little bit of a head start with our experience with having our own pets? So when humans are living in close proximity with animals, they develop a sort of expertise about those species, the same way parents develop expertise about children without any formal training. And of course, it's not scientific, but it is a rich folk knowledge from which the science is built up from. And we do have a head start when it comes to the animals that live in our houses. Looks like with dogs and perhaps with cats, there have been these co-evolutionary Um, processes between human beings and dogs and that we've maybe domesticated one another as well right (laughs) and this research on dog cognition or dognition uh, that sprung up over the last 10 years or so i think has been extremely promising it's a really good place for us to start in understanding other animal minds one important aspect of dognition is intelligence Knowing how smart an animal is, is surely a good place to start if we're trying to figure out how animals experience the world. LSE Research Fellow Rosalind Arden specialises in canine intelligence. We met in the popular dog hangout Regent's Park, where she told me her work can be traced back to her own dog, Jenny. My daughter said, oh, I want a dog, I want something that just loves me unconditionally. So I said, no, 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 not on your nanny, I'm not getting a dog, never will, never dream of it. And of course, six weeks later, we had a dog. 
and uh, this dog just kind of sat on my feet throughout most of my PhD being absolutely adorable and I really invested heavily in her I think because we were alone together a lot and I would notice that she would know things that I hadn't taught her so things like come and sit I taught her explicitly and I it wasn't surprising to me that she learned those things but one day I was talking to my partner and I said hey uh, I wonder if David's coming around and Jenny the dog just immediately flipped her head round to the window and looked as if to see if his car was coming up the drive or that's what it appeared to be and then I thought oh man she has picked things she's picked up what we would call an acoustic signal you know the sound of a word and she's made it associated with that real thing David my son and she's looking to see in the only plausible place which is the direction he could maybe be coming from so I started to notice things and I would notice say for example if I would say hey look at that bird she'd immediately look up at the sky nowhere else and I thought ah, I think she's kind of I think she's picked up some language without me actually teaching it to her explicitly she's just made that association and then I just started thinking you know what, I'd love to be systematic and learn about this a little bit more. So, how did Rosaden set about devising a series of tests to measure dog IQ? Well, the first thing I thought about was, you know, what's a dog trying to do in its dog life? And I thought, okay, well, a dog will want to be able to estimate size. You want to know who to take on and who to back off from. It's kind of a, probably an advantage to know the difference between bigger and smaller. A dog, I thought, will want to know how to get about. And a dog will want to know how to read others' intentions to some extent, particularly humans' intentions, because dogs have co-evolved with humans. Rosalind quickly realised that dog IQ should be measured in terms of skills that dogs need. In other words, dog IQ is about how well they dog, not how well they human. With this in mind, she set about constructing some tests to assess variations in intelligence between dogs. I mean, it was very funny because I was just so confident that it, this was going to be a piece of cake and I was so wrong. So these um, really well experienced dog people in Wales had a barn and uh, I'd get calls from them sitting at my desk in London and they'd be saying things like, we set up the testing room and he just came out, came in and just peed over everything. <laughs> there was one um, test that we did which involved comparing bigger and smaller and so we had paper plates with peanut butter smeared on them within uh, concentric circles and I was being the dog uh, crawling around on the floor trying to figure out what height was the right height and which you know field vision the dog had so that we could figure out how to make the test work. Rosalind's work is still in its early stages but she has come to some important conclusions. Firstly her findings indicate that a dog's intelligence is structured much like our own. If they're good at one task, they tend to be good at another. And this suggests there is such a thing as general intelligence in dogs. But how intelligent are dogs when compared to other species? I think a dog has evolved to do dog things and a camel has evolved to do camel things. So I think the question's kind of bonkers. Having said that, it's quite obvious that some animals have great behavioural flexible repertoires and I'm not denying that, but I think asking whether or not a camel or an octopus is smarter is kind of a dumb question. So, we shouldn't be pitting dogs against cats or llamas versus sea lions in an intelligence league table. More importantly, intelligence shouldn't be used to justify why certain animals are worthy of our care and attention. We don't love dogs for their intelligence, we love them for who they are. Like our kids and our friends and our colleagues, we don't assess people just on their intelligence to figure out if we want them to be close to us. It is not the case that I think the more intelligent animals ought to be treated well and the less intelligent animals should be treated poorly, not at all. I think it's more a case of using intelligence as a bait to get humans to kind of think more carefully about other species. There is some evidence that in primates, when people learn the rich, something about the richness of the primate brain through empirical work getting out in you know, popular science, that people 
started thinking we shouldn't be locking them up in cages and just living them, having them live with a, a concrete floor. We should be treating them better than that. In 2013, the Non-Human Rights Project filed a lawsuit in New York demanding that a chimp named Tommy be given legal rights. Tommy is 26 years old and lives in Gloversville. He is living in a cage at the home of a Fulton County businessman, Patrick Lavery. A group called the Non-Human Rights Project argues that Lavery has no right to keep Tommy. The conditions were pretty awful and inspired the Non-Human Rights Project to take action. That's how we treat a human criminal who's committed the worst kind of offenses. We put them in solitary confinement in, in a cage. These beings have never harmed anyone, and yet they, they suffer the way we would suffer in a, in a cage in solitary confinement. The case attracted a lot of publicity because it argued that humans aren't the only species deserving of rights. Tommy, they argued, should be considered as a non-human person, and that to be a person necessarily means you have rights, and those rights should prohibit people like Lavery being able to own and confine chimpanzees. So legal person means that you count in a courtroom. You're not invisible to the judges. Kristen Andrews followed Tommy's story closely and highlights why the case is significant in terms of how, as a society, we need to rethink how we understand animals. I mean, one thing that is important to know to begin with is that the legal grounding for personhood and rights, what you have is a situation such that you are either a person who's granted legal rights, or you are an entity, you're an object, and you don't have legal rights. Um, so you can be owned, you can be bought, and you can be sold. And when it comes to things like tables and chairs and books and other objects, um, it's very easy to categorize them into the objects, the things that don't have rights, and we can buy them and sell them. And when it comes to human beings, it's very easy to categorize them as persons with rights who can't be bought or sold. But then we have this whole set of beings in the middle that neither seem like books or chairs or human beings. And these are the non-human animals. Um, so when you have a non-human animal that's being treated in a way that seems to be problematic, say they're being locked up in a prison, um, like the chimpanzees in this case in New York, so you can't argue that he's a person with rights because he's a chimpanzee. And in the legal context, um, if you're not a person with rights, you're an object like a book or a chair. And so Stephen Weiss with the Non-Human Rights Project was arguing that in fact chimpanzees and other animals should be seen as persons with rights and not like books without rights. Whether some animals should have rights is a contentious subject. Jonathan Birch is sceptical about Tommy's case. When people have wanted to argue that some animals should have rights akin to human rights, the argument has typically been these animals meet all the criteria for personhood. That said, it hasn't been entirely successful so far and it doesn't, it doesn't surprise me. I think there, there, there are real limits to um, an approach that involves trying to get courts to recognise animal rights before the rest of society and before parliaments and congress are there. It's never really been a rights-based approach. What we have is animal welfare laws that put limits on people and limit what people are allowed to do. And legally that is an important difference. The argument against animal rights is not just that animals are not people, but that we already have animal welfare laws and practices animal welfare has on the whole improved in recent years. So why are people arguing for rights for animals like Tommy, and not just stronger animal welfare laws? When you're thinking about animal welfare, you're still thinking about animals as objects owned by us. Animal welfare is about the proper handling of material, is one way of putting it. Right? So we have laws about how to handle nuclear material, and animal welfare is kind of like that. It's kind of saying, well, when you're handling a chicken in a chicken facility, you need to handle them such that they have this much space, they have this much light, and so on and so forth. Um, but you're not respecting them as valuable in and of themselves. There is no attention paid to the individual as something that's an autonomous being, as opposed to something that has importance in a relational way 
that they have instrumental value related to human beings. And I think that when you start talking about animal rights um, and as opposed to just animal welfare, it really forces you to stop thinking in a paternalistic way about animals, as in how can we handle them in order to achieve our goals while being good people and not torturing anybody. You're listening to LSEIQ. In this episode, we're asking, what's it like to be an animal? As opposed to animal welfare, animal rights, i.e. giving some animals personhood, would fundamentally shift how society understands animals. For the first time, we would say that at least some animals are not objects, but are non-human people with their own intrinsic rights. So far, the idea has not succeeded in the courtroom. In the first case of its kind, a New York appeals court has rejected an animal rights advocate's bid to extend legal personhood to chimpanzees. The court has said the animals are incapable of bearing the responsibilities that come with having legal rights. Tommy's case ultimately ended in failure, although one of the judges presiding over the case has subsequently expressed reservations about his ruling, conceding, while it may be arguable that a chimpanzee is not a person, there is no doubt that it is not merely a thing. The path to personhood clearly faces a lot of barriers. If you offer rights to a chimpanzee, who's next? And is it going to be a chicken and a cow or a pig? And if I'd like to eat chickens and cows and pigs, does that mean I have to stop eating chickens and cows and pigs? I think that's, that's a real blockage. And I, I think that it's a blockage that it's important to be really sympathetic to. It's, our, it's a culture that people have grown up in eating these animals. Um, and it's not going to be a, a switch, throwing a switch, seeing a legal argument or a philosophical argument isn't going to make people think or feel that what they've been doing their whole life has been horrific. But with lots of other cases of social justice, I think that we see changes that happen over generations. While there are challenges, the case for animal rights is only just beginning. It's important to remember that ascribing personhood to all humans has had a long and painful history. Developing a more robust definition of personhood is therefore vital if we are to create a better society. Kristen has been playing a crucial role in this. She has been developing a better definition of what it means to be a person, both non-human and human, and has devised what can be described as a cluster-based approach. My work in this project was kind of detailing what it is to be a person with rights, what these properties are, what sort of capacities you might have, what sort of relationships you might have in order to be deemed a person, and to argue that chimpanzees, in fact, have a lot of these, uh, these properties, like humans, like humans who are babies, who maybe don't have a lot of cognitive capacities yet. Um, or even like humans who don't have a lot of friends and just like to be by themselves. That in fact, what we see is not, hey, you have to have this particular thing, you have to have language, or you have to have metacognition, or you have to have theory of mind um, in order to be a person, because we know humans who lack all of those things. Instead, in my work, what I've been arguing is that we have a cluster concept of a person, so you think about all of these properties that we associate with human beings, right? That we are in relationships with others. We have empathy. We are moral. We have language. We have metacognition, except when we don't. And we look to see what sort of clusters of those properties exist in other species as well, right? So it's not that you need to have any one of those in particular, but if you have an array of those, then you're more like the human case than you are like the book case. And you ought to be granted rights the way human beings are. And if you don't want to be locked in a garage, um, you shouldn't be locked in a garage. Personhood in animals or humans cannot be boiled down to one characteristic. It's not necessarily about being smart or good at one particular thing. But what are some of the possible aspects of personhood? So uh, rationality um, is one of the properties that often gets um, presented as really important for personhood or, or a rights bearer. And rationality was a property that for a very long time was associated purely with humans. Right? Aristotle called human the rational animal, after all. 
And it, it took some time before humans became smart enough to realize that other animals are also rational. <laughs> uh, some of this came from research in labs, doing experiments. This is an old story too, the story of Crispus's dog, right? And that's a, um, a story where the dog was chasing a hare down a path and the path forked into three different paths. And the dog sniffed the first path, the dog sniffed the second path, and then without sniffing, ran down the third path. Right, that's, a, that's an example of reasoning from exclusion. It's a logical reasoning capacity. Another property that's been associated with personhood over the years has been empathy. Um, chimpanzees have been shown to help other chimpanzees cross busy roads that cut through their environments. This is usually um, an alpha male leading a group single file across a road. The photos are brilliant. <laughs> um, yeah, so a lot of these properties having to do with, you know, intelligence or like rationality or mental time travel and others have more social like empathy and morality um, kind of come together to form this richer picture of a person as someone who's smart and caring, right? <laughs> who's got intelligence um, and also fellow feeling. Is this clustered approach to understanding um, the rights of animals, does that Will that need to be applied with each particular species? Yeah, that's a great question. I think that right now we're at a position where going species by species actually makes some sense. Um, or at least maybe taxes, um, looking at, say, great apes and looking at old world monkeys and new world monkeys and looking at cetaceans. There must be a tension between seeing things that are similar, but also recognizing difference variety so you're not going around in your own like mini disney movie thinking they're all exactly like me yeah and i think one of the things that's really kind of complements understanding the diversity in animal species is understanding the diversity among humans right so once you start seeing that even within your own culture you have neurodiversity you can't assume that all people are going to be just like you in the way they respond to situations the way they feel their cognitive capacities and then once you realize also that across cultures people are going to be responding differently there are different cultural norms and social norms that there's a ton of diversity among humans i think it makes it easier to see the diversity in other species as well and not be afraid of diversity and not think oh the chimpanzee has to be just like me in order to be valuable. No, the chimpanzee doesn't, right? There are very few people who are just like me, um, and that's great. There's a lot of interesting sets of properties out there, and I think our challenge is finding out what those sets of properties are and come appreciating the different ways in which they cluster. I mean, what kind of persons are they, and what sort of rights should we um, ascribe to them, given their own needs and interests? Kristen's conception of personhood embraces the idea of animal diversity. It also links back to Rosalind Arden's work on dog IQ, which asks us to think about the world from a dog's point of view. Just because an animal is different doesn't mean it hasn't got its own rich inner life. But how far does this go? Can we empathise with animals that are very different from us? What about an octopus or a lobster? Rights for these animals are certainly not being considered by lawmakers at this stage but they are thinking about their welfare and their capacity to experience feelings. The sentience, or capacity for feeling, in invertebrates is one focus of Jonathan Birch's research. His work has resulted in the UK government calling for certain invertebrates, cephalopod mollusks, such as octopuses, and decapod crustaceans, things like crabs, to be regarded as sentient as part of the forthcoming Animal Welfare Bill. And I think there's quite a good case for trying to bring in some regulations on slaughter methods at least, if nothing else, to try and stop some of the gratuitous and extreme slaughter methods that are often used on invertebrates, particularly crabs and lobsters, things like dropping them in boiling water, where I don't think anyone really thinks of that as best practice even now, but there's no law to stop it, not in the UK. And that to me would be a really simple and easy way to actually show that we care about these animals. And what about insects? How should we be thinking about them? This is the film classic, Honey, I Shrunk the Kids. Early on, the shrunken kids of the title meet and befriend an ant. Then, in a dramatic final scene, 
the ant sacrifices itself by defending the kids from a vicious scorpion. He looks hurt. Oh! He saved my life. As an impressionable young child, the movie revolutionised how I thought about ants. No longer were they something to be trodden on, but a creature that should be treated with kindness and respect. So, should we be thinking about how we treat insects? Yeah, I remember kids cutting up worms when I was a child as well. People are often casually cruel to invertebrates, and, and of course I, I oppose that. Yeah, it is very important that if we're going to impose harm on any animal that we think might be sentient, we have a good reason to do so. And so it's very important not to be gratuitously cruel in the way that stamping on animals for no reason or cutting them up for no reason or dropping them in boiling water for no reason is gratuitous. And we certainly can't rule out the possibility that insects have feelings. If they do, they're implemented in a very different way to those of mammals. But that doesn't rule out the, the possibility that they have uh, feelings. And so if the evidence does tend in that direction, we'll have some tough questions about how we treat insects going forward. Now, I think there really is something absurd about the idea of um, you know, a ban on treading on insects or something like that, because something like that would be completely impractical and unenforceable. Nonetheless, there are real issues about insect farming, where you have these insect farms where you know, millions and millions of insects are packed into tiny spaces and then sort of put through shredders, where that's currently outside the scope of animal welfare legislation completely. And you might think, well, if the evidence does point towards some insects having feelings, should it really be completely beyond the reach of animal welfare law? Or should we be trying to think about ways in which we could formulate some practical, sensible, proportionate regulations to make sure that people are not just gratuitously torturing insects? Whether we're thinking about animal rights or animal welfare, one thing is clear. There is a palpable interest in and concern about animals, how they experience the world and how we should relate to them. Where has this interest come from? And more importantly, where will it take us? Well, there are two different kinds of answers I can give. One is a kind of funny, silly answer, which might actually be true, but the internet. Right. So the Internet of cats and the Internet of dogs and all of these hilarious videos that we see all the time brings animals into um, our houses, on our phones. And it's fascinating to watch. People love it. And it also shows us a really different side of animals when we see like a pig and a kitten becoming best friends or a goose living in someone's house. Um, I think that's had a certain effect. And from that, things have kind of steamrolled a bit. So you see documentary films being made that have had a lot of impact. But another reason I don't know if it's really um, true or not, but I wonder to what extent people have been feeling like there's been a certain amount of good progress when it comes to social justice in humans, among human groups. Obviously, nowhere near perfect. Um, I don't mean to imply that at all. But there's been progress and appreciation of all sorts of difference, culturally, sexually, and as far as ability goes. These are being taught to my daughter in school, right? That's progress. That did not happen when I was 13. Um, and it might be that people are feeling optimistic because there is so much at least education and talk about these topics. Not yet. Translating into a lot of um, impacts on people's lives, I'm afraid. But it might be that people feel like, yeah, we can also start thinking about the interests of non-human animals as well. That we can't just stop at humans. That there's no real way to justify stopping at promoting the interests and welfare of humans who are different from me but we can promote interests of all the sentient creatures. As we collectively strive to expand the circle of social justice for animals, I can't help but think what I should be doing. 
What role can I play in improving the lives of animals? I then hear a meow and see my cat, Otis, patiently staring up at me. While I might not know exactly what is going on in his mind, I can tell he's hungry and annoyed I haven't fed him yet. I better go feed him. If you'd like to find out more about the research in this episode, please head to the show notes. And if you enjoy LSEIQ, please leave us a review. That's it for this season of LSEIQ. We'll be back in the autumn with more interesting questions with social science answers.